Hey kids cook real food, Katie Kimball here for the Healthy Parenting Connector. And I'm pretty excited about today because let me tell you, snacks and desserts are two of the most hot button topics, I think, when it comes to parents and kids and food. And we've got dietitian Edwina Kennedy here back for her second interview. You know, she's awesome if we have her back because that's only happened like a handful of times. Edwina, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me back. I love being on here last time. So I'm excited to do this again. Nice. Well, parents, you got to watch Edwina's first interview as well. But just in case you haven't, let me do like the official introduction here for the Healthy Parenting Connector. Edwina Kennedy is a mom of two and the registered pediatric dietitian behind My Little Eater, a platform that helps families feel confident raising healthy little eaters. She offers online courses for baby led feeding and feeding toddlers and has helped thousands of parents reduce stress and set the foundation for lifelong healthy eating. So first of all, Edwina, this is so important because picky eating has absolutely become an epidemic. And I do think that parents can prevent that by starting with the right habits young. So your role is very important. And I also have to say that I think following you on Instagram is a must for any parent of any age kid, just because you have so many helpful tips that, that really span the ages. Thank you. So what, what is your story though? What, why did you choose to focus on toddlers and what sort of drew your heart toward nutrition? Okay. Well, as you mentioned before, I am a mom. And so definitely that was the biggest factor is kind of the experience going through feeding my own kids, which when they were babies, to be quite honest, went pretty smoothly. I did not do all the quote unquote right things, but I was confident. I was, you know, feeding intuitively and they were, you know, for the most part doing excellent. And then, um, just about when my kids were, almost two and almost four, it was like they woke up one day and they were just picky, both at once, probably they played off of each other. And they came to the table and they didn't want anything besides like the typical fast food type food, they wanted like, you know, chicken nuggets, they wanted fries, they wanted pizza, and then nothing else. And uh, being I mean, at this point, I wasn't even fully graduated as a dietitian, but I was in the nutrition program. And of course, it was so important to me. And I was freaking out. And I don't know what to do. And oh, my God, I can't have kids who are picky or who are eating these types of foods all the time. So, you know, I tried different things. Um, and my husband and I, you know, we were both kind of in in it together. And we would bicker and we would argue and we would throw around random ideas. And he would tell me, well, you know what, Edwina, I think the main reason is because we're not giving them kids food. Like we're expecting them to eat our food and that doesn't make sense because they need kids food. And I was like, no, even though I didn't know every, everything about this topic yet, I was confident that was not the answer. And that really one meal was, should be okay for everybody. So that's when I started really digging into like the feeding therapy side of things, the picky eating side of things. Cause I knew what to feed my kids. I knew the nutrition like down pat. I knew how much iron and fiber and I knew how many servings of vegetables and I knew how much milk to like, I knew all that, but then how, to actually get them to eat it <laughs> and how to deal with the mealtime behavior. That was the part that I really um, wanted to not only find the right true answers because there was stuff out there, but it was conflicting and it was hard to find. But then even then it was finding a way to kind of create a step-by-step -step process. Because again, a random tip here and a random tip there, I knew from other areas of nutrition, it wasn't going to work unless I had it kind of down pat in terms of like foundations and then add-ons and then, you know, the like extra fun little tricks and tips. So that was what I set out to do. And to kind of sum it all up two years later, I had tried a whole bunch of my kids. Um, they had started, you know, transforming within like a couple months. And then I tried it on my clients and we just kind of kept it going. And then the online courses were born. <laughs> I am sure so many parents out there are just nodding like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the how, how in the world do we make this happen? And uh, so we're, we're with you, <laughs> but you had the degree and you had clients to test things on and you had the drive to do it. And I love that you just shared that you and your husband did not see eye to eye. Like you're telling me what he said. And I'm like, no, no, that's not right. <laughs> so, so thank you for being humble and sharing that story. Parents, the reason we're talking again is because I ended up with such a huge list of questions for our last interview that I just had to make the call to cut it off. And we stopped recording and I said, Edwina, we didn't even touch snacks. We didn't touch sweets. There's so much more I want to hear from you about. 
And so that's why we just like, we're going to laser in today specifically on snacks and sweets or desserts or sugar, whatever. I don't know what we're going to call it. We'll know by the end of like this half hour or so, but okay, girl, why are snacks such a bane of parents' existence? Like I see, I see people out at church or at a park and they, they have not one snack. They have two snacks and three snacks. And you know that these parents are like, this is the primary goal of them leaving the house is do I have enough food to feed my child three times before we get home? What's going on? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so true. It's the most common scenario you'll see with parents. And I like to call it the snack trap because it really does feel like you're trapped in this cycle ongoing of like, you can't leave the house without tons of snacks and you're terrified that they may ask for one and you don't have one on hand, right? So I think where it really starts is obviously it comes from um, good you know, intentions and kind of normal parental worry about, is my child hungry? And then responding to that normal you know, parental instinct to feed my child when they're hungry. And what happens is kids at a very early age learn that one, snacks are really good because those types of foods are usually not chicken and broccoli and rice. It's usually granola bar, goldfish, yogurt. And two, they also learn when I ask for snacks, mom or dad will give it to me right away. So it's this learned pattern. So there's like the physiological like need for more of that, those carbs and those easy palatable foods. And they're so fun and they come in cool packages and, com- you know, combined with the fact that it's this instant gratification from mom and dad. And again, I, you know, it, it's just kind of a cycle that, that goes on and on. So I don't know if you want me to kind of get into tips and to how to, <laughs> how to kind of overcome this. Yeah, and, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to just start with the fact that kind of the point number one that I made is that the snacks are so incredibly palatable and they're so appealing to kids. So what I like to say is the best way to combat that is to make meals and snacks look almost one in the same. They're not always going to look the same, but they're going to look more and more similar to each other, especially the better you get at thinking outside of the box. Because again, we usually think, well, what is a typical snack food? And we have a category for foods that only fit under snacks, right? And then our kids, of course, learn that as well. So if it's something that can be grabbed quickly from the pantry, that's a snack food. No preparation besides opening up a crinkly package. That's a snack food. Um, you know, and I understand, by the way, I understand that it's like, you know, so we were already cooking three meals a day. We're already exhausted. We've got tons on the go. But again, we kind of start to see where a problem starts to happen. So what I like to do is if, if we were to say, okay, how can we make them look a little bit more similar to each other so that kids aren't favoring snacks over meals? One of the ways is by thinking of like the types of items that may require one or two minutes to prep. And I'm not, again, I'm not talking you're in the kitchen and you're, you've got the stove top on and you're doing a whole bunch of things, but maybe it's like some quick, easy fruit, like blueberries or strawberries or whatever berries or banana, whatever, kind of something quick that you can kind of wash and just serve and something else that's going to be paired with that. That's going to help fill them up which I think we're going to talk about in a little bit, Um, just kind of like how you want to pair things together, but something that's going to be like, again, nice and quick, like um, cheese on a plate. So rather than cheese string package that they're eating wherever and just like a quick handout, it's like, no, we're going to take the time to put this on a plate. We're going to plate it with something in addition to it. And we're going to sit down at the table and we're going to have an official snack time. So that already looks much more like a meal, even though we haven't gotten into like, muffin recipes and we haven't gotten into like, you know, all these other crazy things. It's just sitting down and making it at least feel and look more like a meal. So that's one of the things. Um, You can also do things just really quickly, like um, have boiled eggs in the fridge. So this definitely involves some meal prep, but I mean, having something you can grab quick that you know is going to be, you know, nourishing and non-cook in that in specific moment. If you want to even just do toast and peanut butter, something like that works really well. But again, on a plate and it looks different than maybe that goldfish package that you're offering them. Um, So that's one of the things. And then the second thing is to tackle that 
other problem of every time I ask for a snack, I get one. Every time I ask for a snack, I get one. And I have to pack three in for, you know, in a two hour time span. We want to make sure our kids are more on a schedule, even with snacks. So this is something that is really easy to, you know, for most parents to kind of fall into the habit of just like offering them whenever. But if we kind of think of snacks again, like meals, we got to think about first, what's the purpose of them? The purpose is to truly satisfy hunger. It's not to feed when they're bored. It's not to distract them. I mean, sometimes maybe, yes, <laughs> I totally get, you may need a little bit of distraction at certain times, but we definitely don't want that to become the norm or the habit. So if we think about that and you know, kind of, again, the physiology of um, a child's, child's body and their appetite, their digestive system, most kids under five, really two to three hours, they can last between a meal and a snack. So if you are giving them, you know, set meal times and you've got all of the foundations in place that I teach in my course, you know, they're filling up at mealtime, you can give two to three hours before you, you know, offer that again. And if your child says I'm hungry or I want a snack in between, that's where I want you to teach them what is hunger? Like, are you actually hungry? You know, is this, are you just bored? Do you want to hug? Do you want some mommy time? Do you want to play? Um, you know, what, whatever it might be. So basically going on a schedule like that, where you have a mid morning, mid afternoon snack, maybe a bedtime snack, if it's merited. And then, um, and then, like I said, kind of making meals and snacks look more similar. Those are kind of the two best strategies to help combat that. Those are fantastic. I like how you laid out the two problems and then like, boom, antidote, boom, antidote. And, uh, and you're right though. Like it really is a serious problem in, in my program. I call it MS 91 and done between a meal and a snack, at least 90 minutes. And, and really you're right. Two to three hours. Okay. I'm like giving grace to people by saying 90 minutes. And some folks even struggle with that. Like, I don't, Katie, I think they'll be hangry. And I'm like, in 90 minutes, I don't, it's not true. <laughs> you got to feed them better. Um, and I think another, another worry for parents, because you're right, like it's all well-intentioned, right? We want our kids to feel happy, feel content, to not feel the pain of hunger. But parents really worry about the size of the snack. How do I determine how much to feed and portion size? You got any tips for that? Yes. Um, when it comes to snacks specifically, when you think about younger, I would say like, maybe even I'll give, again, I'll give a little grace, two years of age and under, you see more of a meals and snacks being the same in um, quantity. Like, so let me backtrack. So a baby who's, let's say nursing or, you know, formula feeding, their meals are really just like the same amount of milk every single time, like maybe yep. every two to three hours or something like that. And when you start adding in snacks, it should really still be the same amount of food as you're seeing at mealtime. Because again, their tummies are little, their tummies are going to empty out a lot quicker. And then we need to fill it up with a good amount in between. So we're not really restricting the size of, sna of snacks early on. Later, as they get a little bit older, maybe they enter preschool, or maybe even if you wanted to even push it a little bit further out into like, you know, early school age kids, um, you want to kind of at least pay attention to is the snack preventing, like filling them up too much that they're not able to eat their meal. Most of the time, if you've got it spaced out enough, you don't run into that problem and letting them just eat as much as they want within that snack period is totally okay. But sometimes you may need to kind of scale it back a little bit, especially, especially if it's one of those really highly palatable, easy to eat addicting <laughs> snacks, right? Yep. So in terms of portion sizes for snacks, that's kind of what I want to say. And then in terms of meals, really, you want your child to be eating according to their own hunger and fullness cues, which is so frustrating for parents to hear because they're like, I want specifics. Like, I want to know, like, is two bites of chicken enough? Like, what if they only eat like a small thing of applesauce? Like, is that enough? And to that, I'm sorry, but I have to just say it could be enough for your child child in that specific meal as long as you are feeding on a schedule once again you're not pressuring them to eat and you're making sure that they they know that there's always again that other opportunity to eat at a set time because what's going to happen is when you have that schedule in place they're going to learn I need to fill up 
in that moment. I need to make sure that I get what I need, fill my tummy all the way up and I'm learning what full actually feels like because I'm not going to get something till two hours later. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one of the ways that they'll learn to fill up. And again, if applesauce is all they needed in that moment or in that meal, I should say, then I want parents to learn to trust that. They know it's hard. But if you look at kind of, again, what happens from babyhood to toddlerhood, you actually see less of that like regular, you know, five ounces or six ounces of milk every single time, like that same like appetite. Mm -hmm. And it starts to fluctuate. And you start to see maybe like double the amount taken in at one meal or one day, and then bites taken the next meal or skipped meals. And so if we kind of zoom out and we say, maybe they didn't get a lot this meal, but what about over the period of a day or even better, the period of a week? I really, really think it's much more accurate if you zoom out to like seven days and you say over this period, did they get enough dairy or vegetables or protein? And, you know, learning kind of like how many servings of each on average, do you want your child to eat based on their age? Chances are when parents actually see that and do that, they're like, oh, well, I guess they did do fine. And if we leave them to kind of, again, tune into those hunger and fullness cues and leave them to do their own thing at mealtimes, you'll see that they're actually not starving for anything. Even if they had that applesauce there, because yesterday, guess what? They had three helpings of your lasagna. So it that's kind of like the best, I know, very vague, but the best answer I can give in terms of portion sizes is you have to kind of set up the foundation for them to be able to eat according to their hunger and fullness cues. And then that's going to fluctuate and you just got to kind of list, listen to them. And feed yeah. Them. I mean, I think that's so encouraging though, to tell parents like you can trust your child. You should look at the big picture. There's a very wide range of normal in a given meal. And then, but there's a huge but though, right? And yes. that's as long as you're not tricking their system with those highly palatable, highly addictive foods. Yeah. Is a kid going to ask for another kind bar or granola bar? Yes, <laughs> they are. Are they going to ask for more broccoli? Maybe not, but that's not their fault. That's not their hunger and satiety cues. That's processed food. Exactly. I mean, anyway. I think you know, if a plate of fries was placed in front of me and I had just finished my meal or nachos, I mean, who's not going <laughs> to reach out and grab it? Even if I know I'm full in this moment, like it's right there. And it's kind of, again, more of those easy, like one of those easy to eat foods. So, oh yeah, you kind of want to, you want to really trust in that meal that when they say they're full, especially if it's like a whole food, you know, homemade, whatever, like more of a well-rounded balanced meal, then you can trust that they are truly full. And then the other requests are more behavioral things you want to tackle, mm -hmm. not you know, nutritional needs because they're starving. It's really more just habit. Yeah. Oh, very good dichotomy behavior and habit versus actual physical hunger. Um, now you have something you call the FFP method for finding a balance. Tell us about that. Yes. Okay. The FFP method has helped so many of my clients just like really clearly think about how to build a meal and it makes it so much easier. So FFP is basically an acronym for fiber, fat, and protein. So there are basically the three major nutrients that you want to make sure every single meal has a really good source of, not just like a touch of protein and a touch of fiber. We want a good source of each one. And I have a list of different foods, you know, that in, in my courses, but I can kind of go through like you know, some examples of foods that go under the fiber category, under the fat and under the protein that will satisfy those, um, those criteria or that criteria. So for fiber, definitely fruit and vegetables is at the top of the list. It is one of the easiest ways to get in, you know, that bulking fiber. And it's really, um, again, providing so much more nutrition on the other side of things as well. So fruit and vegetables, beans, lentils, chickpeas are really, really great sources of fiber. Um, uh, chia seeds and flax seeds and kind of like even a little to an extent like hemp seeds, but like pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, especially for younger kids, you can grind them up, but that's gonna provide lots of good fiber. Um, obviously whole grains. I mean, that's probably what most people would think of. So whole grains is going to go in there. So whole grain pasta, whole grain rice, you know, wild rice, the more un or the less unprocessed it is, the better always. And, um, I'm going to just, before I kind of jump into protein and fat, I just want to say the reasoning behind all this, by the way, is really just because 
When you have this combination of FFP, you are going to make sure your child's blood sugar levels are as stable as possible. You're not going to see extreme spikes in the types, uh, you know, in the blood sugar after certain types of foods that they're eating because it's more balanced. And when you have, usually we're really great at having like, you know, some type of produce like blueberries, let's say alongside of maybe a banana or crackers or something else, but believe it or not, both of those fall within one category, fiber, right? So what's happening is you're seeing still, even though they're healthy, they're great, but you're still seeing a little, you know, quite a bit of a spike in blood sugar levels. But when you add protein and when you add fat to that in good amounts, you're going to see a stabilization and they're going to be able to last longer between meals. And overall, that's going to be much healthier. And you're not going to have that hangry kid in between meals and snacks that we were talking about earlier. So all right, so now that I said that, let's go back to some more examples. So we did some fiber, um, some protein options, eggs, meat, any type of meat, really don't worry if there's a little bit of fat on there. Um, if anything, it's adding from the fat category, right? Um, salmon or any type of fish, like you could do lean fish, white fishes, or you could do some more oily fishes like sardines and salmon and mackerel. Um, Specific types of dairy are going to be higher in protein. So I want you to focus on those like Greek yogurt or cottage cheese. Um, that's going to be way more satiating and more fulfilling of that protein category. Um, again, beans, lentils, chickpeas. So if you notice, I already mentioned them in the fiber category. So it doubles up. If you have, let's say, a bowl of vegetarian chili, you have just crossed off a fiber and a protein in one. So you can go ahead and add more meat or add meat if you wanted, but you don't have to. So that would be enough there. Um, okay, I'm like blanking, but I'll just give you those few ones for protein. And then for fat, you wanna focus on, ideally plant-based fats is going to be kind of the best to focus on. So avocado and avocado oil, olives and olive oil, flax, flaxseed oil, um, chia seeds as well is going to have. And again, those pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, any type of nuts, almonds, butter, peanut butter. Um, so that again, crosses over with um, some of the fiber. So um, let me think, egg yolk is also going to be a great source of fat. And then again, the fatty fish salmon, tuna, mackerel, herring, sardines, that crosses over with the protein, but also a wonderful source of DHA, omega-3 fatty acids for your child. So hope that's not too overwhelming, but basically you're going to pair one, you're going to take one thing from each and just make sure you've got that crossed off. And this becomes so much easier. I mean, as you do this once or twice, you're like, oh, okay. As long as you know what food goes under what category, you can easily kind of just start to pick out. I'm just going to add in a, a thing of like, um, you know, broccoli on the side, or I'm going to add in this little bit of Greek yogurt. I'm going to sprinkle some hemp seeds and that's going to fulfill that last category. Boom. And now my meal is complete and I can feel okay that my child is actually nourished, getting all the nutrients they need and filling up. Yeah. And I think we can apply this to snacks too, right? Instead of grab an apple, Hey, how about an apple and some nut butter? Boom. Oh. Now it's more satiating or carrots and hummus with that little drizzle of olive oil. Right. And so, like you said, it gets easier as you go. Um, and yeah, really, yeah. really good. Now, Edwina, do you think that we are generally overfeeding our kids in America, in North America? I would think that Going back to the snack issue, yes, mm -hmm. I think that we see so many extra calories, you know, in this decade compared to two decades ago, mm -hmm. mostly coming from the snacking. So a lot Which of- is usually low fiber, low protein, yeah. and low fat. Ah! Exactly. All of the above, right? So you're basically giving a process form of carbohydrate, which breaks down into sugar really quickly. And again, it's not providing all of those nutrients. And you know what? The marketing schemes are so good these days. Like it seems like, oh my God, but it has kale in there and it's got sweet potato in there. And you're like, yeah, but if you look at the nutrition label, I'm like, I don't even see any extra vitamin A. And they're like, I don't even know where they're getting this. It's, it's again, it's all about the processing of it is just metabolized differently. And I'm not, I'm not here to say never offer your kids these because I'm a parent. I know that these are, you know, types of foods that you become, you need to rely on at times. You have to, it's just the way of life. Right. But um, if we can kind of think about the types, 
that, or I guess the, the type of nutrition that we're getting from that, it's really, really not even close most times to, you know, the whole foods. So anyway, I think I may have gotten off track there, but I think those snacky foods really are what's contributing to too much calories, Mm. if you want to think of it that way, or just overeating in the sense of we're teaching our child to eat when they're not even hungry. Right. Yeah. Boredom eating, distraction eating. Do you see any uh, negative ramifications either short-term or long-term with this that like we need to stop because? Yeah. I mean, as you may have experienced, I feel like all of us have experienced, I mean, how much, how much struggle do most adults have with, you know, being able to like watch a TV at, in the evening without having something in front of them. Or um, again, we're just have to have food, you know, or coffee from Starbucks that's like filled with sugar and cream, whatever, just out of habit. So what happens is we lose that ability, that innate ability that we had when we were babies right? And very young toddlers to truly respond to what our body needs and eat when we're only hungry or, and stop when we're full. And then we start to listen to these external factors. Well, it's 12 o'clock. This is when I usually eat lunch. So I'm going to have to eat lunch right now, even though I'm not hungry. Right. Or, um, well, every time we go to this meeting, we always have these muffins in front of us and like, well, it's just what I, what we do, like, it'd be weird, you know? So we're kind of listening to these external factors and we start to unknowingly teach that to our child to our children sometimes again it all comes from a good place so if we think about when our toddlers were younger and we're seeing them only eat the applesauce or we seeing see them only eat two bites of chicken we come in and we say that's not enough you got to eat more take another bite you know um you can't leave the table until you do this or you can't have your dessert until you have this and that is where we start to slowly kind of ingrain them with those ideas that I guess I can't trust my body. And I guess I don't know full, I guess I have to listen to my parents, or I guess I need that external kind of factor, that external trigger to tell me when I need to eat or when I need to stop. Right. So that's kind of how it starts. Well, I was going to ask you what can parents do to teach kids to listen to their internal cues, but I think you just answered it. It's like, just don't give them other reasons, right? Just sort of they're, they're naturally going to do the right thing if we don't get in the way. Yeah. And I mean, I think that you can also think about outside of just not kind of pressuring them or, you know, letting them eat what they want. I think also just kind of setting the environment up in a way that is going to allow them to be mindful and present at that meal. So again, if you think about sometimes we're eating in the car, sometimes we're eating, you know, as they're, or we're feeding them as they're playing in the playroom or they're watching TV, we've got these distractions. I think if we just think about, okay, can I remove any and all distractions? Can I make this more of a ritualistic thing? Like instead of, again, mealtime being a place where like mom is shoveling food down my throat and I'm like kind of doing this thing and that thing at the same time, we're going to stop. We're going to like make time for this. We're going to come to the table. We're going to sit down together as a family or even just one, you know, one other person there. And we're going to like spend at least 15 minutes here. And when you can tune everything out, then they can tune into their bodies, right? So that's like another way that you can teach them, like be present, be mindful, listen to your body and, you know, even coach them or, or talk to them as they're eating. And especially if, if you're really new at implementing this feeding schedule, you can say to them, you know what, honey, we're not going to remember, there's not going to be food until snack time. That's not going to be till after we go come back from X, Y, Z. So make sure your tummy's full. And over time, they're going to learn what does full mean? Okay. By actually realizing, let's say I ate too much, or I was still hungry and I wasn't able to last until snack time. And you can tell them, you know what, that feeling there, that's hunger. And I know it feels a little bit like uncomfortable right now. You're going to be okay. We've got another 20 minutes until snack time. Can you hold on? Yeah. Okay. Let's do this instead. So you're talking to them about the feelings about, you know, what it's like to have their stomach full all the way, you know, a little bit of hunger in there. And then during mealtime, you know, check in with them by, you know, after a couple bites or maybe like halfway through the meal, does your tummy feel all the way full? Does it feel like a little bit full? Like, do you think you have any room in there? Because remember, you know, snack is going to be at two o'clock or something. So that kind of conversation really helps them again, tune in and understand and be really mindful about things. 
I think that's a really important shift for parents, Edwina, because what you're saying is talk to kids and teach them about their bodies mm. instead of, I think what a lot of parents gut reaction is, is to talk and tell them how much to eat, right? Yeah. So it's the internal versus the external, like very clearly articulated there. And it's hard. It's hard for parents, but worth it. Yeah. Way, way worth it. Um, now I have a lot of parents, especially those with the toddlers and the preschoolers, and they'll say, "Ah." Katie, my kid is actually hungry at three and four in the morning and they are waking us up. Like I have to do a bedtime snack. So we want to have the most satiating, long lasting bedtime snack possible. What do you recommend for that? So I always go back to the FFP because I'm telling you that rule works. So look at the type of, um, I guess, bedtime snacks you're offering. And usually there's like two to three ro on rotation, right? And see if you are getting in enough, usually it's enough protein and fat that's going to, you know, it's usually missing that that's going to really make the big difference. So again, is a banana what's being offered? Okay. Can you add nut butter on that? Can you have a glass of milk with that? Can you put some cheese slices on the side? Um, again, make sure they're eating it at the table and they're like, you know, not just taking two bites and then going to bed. Like it's, it's really just about like, again, being present and then giving them the full kind of roundup of food. So, um, so those are a couple of examples you could also even do if you wanted, um, like oatmeal or with like, again, not just the oatmeal, cause that's only going to be your fiber, but can you add in, um, sprinkle on hemp seeds, like a good, like a couple tablespoons worth of hemp seeds for at least like seven, 10 grams of protein in there. In addition to whatever protein is in that oatmeal. Um, can you like serve edamame beans is actually a really, really good, quick and easy one. I don't know in, in the States kind of what, I'm sure you guys have way more options than us in Canada, but, um, sometimes at Costco where I live anyway, we have like, there's kind of frozen edamame individual packages at Costco and you just basically take the little package and you pop it in the microwave three minutes, open it up and it's like steamed and ready to go. And that's such a fun snack and it's full, full of fiber and protein. So again, really easy, um, great bedtime snack if you wanted to, uh, to offer that. And even leftovers, again, don't feel like there has to be one specific category of foods just for snacks any leftovers that you have in the fridge, so long as it's not being offered in a punishing way, like you didn't eat your supper, so you have to eat this now. As long as that's not being done, it's totally appropriate and fine. And again, usually a lot more well-rounded with that FFP at bedtime to keep them lasting throughout the night. Yeah, I love that. I always tell parents, make sure the bedtime snack is boring. Yes. <laughs> you know, oh we don't God. want it to be so attractive that it's this habit. It, it either matters because they're hungry or don't bother. <laughs> Totally. I love that. I, there's um, a quote by Ellen Sater, who's a dietitian and like a big feeding guru uh, in, in the field. And she says, make sure your snacks and specifically, I think she was talking about bedtime snacks are filling, but not thrilling. Like just oh. don't make it something once again, that they're going to be like, oh, I can't wait for my bedtime snack, or I'm going to get up in the middle of the night. Cause I know mom's going to give me this one specific type of snack. Like don't make it thrilling, make it really boring. I love what you said about that and just kind of keep it again, level playing field. So with, with meals, so it's serving the purpose of fulfilling hunger and not anything else. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So we were kind of talked about after the meal with the bedtime snack, but man, what about those desserts and sweets? Um, for me, this is the hardest part about feeding kids. We've changed our philosophy over the years. I'm still not quite sure it's right. I think my three older kids already have the habit of like the treat goes after the meal. Um, what do you teach parents about treats, sweets, desserts? What do you call them? All right. Well, to be honest, I, <laughs> there's a lot of conflicting opinions about this again with other experts in the field. I don't think the name matters as much as some people make it matter. You know, some people say don't call them uh, treats because a treat is, you know, you're kind of making it seem like it's something special and different. And I can see that, but I look, my kids are now 11 and 13. I've been through, you know, a, a lot in, in terms of feeding stages with them. And they're going to come to learn that they're special and cool and awesome. Like there's nothing you can do to really truly hide that. Now, when they're younger, I'm talking you know, young school age kids, maybe seven and under, um, definitely for toddlers, you can make it way more neutral 
sounding and feeling. And that is what I teach. And that is what I want. As I get older, it's a lot harder to do. But when they're younger, calling them just by name is definitely probably the best approach I think everyone would agree with. You know, this is cake. This is a chocolate chip cookie. This is carrots. You know, these are carrots. So they're all just factually named. And so there's nothing, you know, this is really good and this is bad for you. And this is, you know, no labeling of that source of that sort, I should say, um, if at all possible. So that's kind of the first thing. And when kids are, I mean, if you think about babies turning one, maybe two, it's pretty easy to keep those types of foods away. I mean, so long as you don't have an older sibling that is like, you know, really accustomed to eating that kind of thing all the time, it's fairly easy. And that's kind of what I recommend, at least until two years of age, you know, there's no need to be offering them ice cream or a cake after a meal or, or apple pie or whatever. Like it's, it's just not really needed at all. And, and they're not going to miss it as they get a little bit older and they're more aware and they can see and notice, Oh, like, you know, on Halloween, there's all these treats around, like, what's this thing? Or I go to this birthday party and there's a cake or, you know, they start to see other kids or a daycare or whatever people are bringing things. That's when you actually, if you haven't introduced them yet, I want you to introduce them in small amounts and kind of frequently enough that they're not going to feel like it's deprived, they're deprived from it, or that again, they haven't had enough experience with it because again, there's no hiding it from kids as they get older, right? It's just a fact of life. We have to teach them more how to manage themselves around these types of foods than completely avoid it, never go near it. Let's just like, you know, burn all the, <laughs> all the candy out of our lives. That's never going to happen. And it's not healthy because they're going to feel that restriction and they're going to feel complete, like almost no power or control over it when they do finally encounter it. So I like to say, I mean, people ask me all the time, like how frequently should I offer desserts, blah, blah, blah. It's totally up to you and your family and what's most normal for your family. Cause I don't want a child to be singled out, but there's a fine line. I do believe that the more you're bringing those foods around, um, you know, unnecessarily, it's going to, of course, train their palate little by little to want more and more. And at the same time, we don't want to completely remove them or never let them show up because then they're going to never be able to understand, you know, what to do around them and, and you know, tr start to like almost become accustomed to them like any other food. It's just, it's there. Yeah, I get chocolate chip cookies sometimes and I get broccoli sometimes and I get bread sometimes, like it's just a food. So somewhere around two to three times a week, I feel like is a great place. And it could be, again, as your kid child gets older, that's where I'd like to settle it at around three times a week. But I know that there are some families out there that like to have dessert every single meal, every single day, I should say. And also, if that's what you do, that's okay. It's, you know, just kind of trying to make the, feel, the child not feel deprived around it. Once they're older, do you have certain like phrases or rules or boundaries that you would set? Because I mean, two to three times a week, if I had a five-year-old, Mm. would be one thing, but man, the moment they leave your house and particularly yeah. once they're middle school, high school, you're out of control. Oh. Do you still try to control anything or just kind of yeah. let them do what they're going to do? <laughs> so honestly, Katie, this is what I'm going through right now. I'd love <laughs> to hear your stories, but I have, I'm learning, I'm learning to let go of the control mm. and I'm relying on the foundation I gave them when they were younger, because now I'm starting to shift my mindset and realize that as long as they continue to like the vegetables and the fruit and the proteins and the lean, you know, or the like whole grains, as long as those are still in their repertoire and they can tolerate it and eat it and accept it, they're going to come back to that eventually. And yes, I'm going to accept over the next five to seven years or whatever. They're probably like, they go out to, you know, Dairy Queen or whatever at lunchtime with their friends. Like they'll, they will have things after school at their friend's house. And I'm not there to control them, but neither I shouldn't be there. I, I don't think I need to be there to control them. So I think this is a period of freedom. And I think we have to let go and we have to just rely on the foundational things that we did teach them and control what you can at home. So, you know, when they come home, even if it's for one meal a day at supper time that's the meal that they get that really nourishing, good, well-balanced thing. And then outside of that, like the freedom has to come and, and they'll, I do believe they're going to come back around. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. That's my hope as well. I've, I have a junior right now, just about to be a senior and graduating. And I'm like, all right, well, another two or three years, I'll sort of know I'll get yeah. my, I'll get my grade and raising the child. Like, did it work? <laughs> we'll find oh, out. <laughs> I'm sure because you know, they're in their, I guess their interest level and their, the importance of nutrition isn't there right now, mm-hmm. but once that clicks for them and once they're like, I want to do this, they're going to be able to eat all those other types of foods again. Right. Cause they've yeah. accepted them and they've grew up on them. Right. It's not like new and hard and difficult and I'm picky and I can't. And uh, you know, so. Yeah, I do. I think all my kids will eat, will eat healthy foods. Well, I don't know where they'll all land, you know, I'm like the sugar <laughs> sweet addiction, the sweet tooth kind of thing. Um, my oldest Paul, he's got quite a sweet tooth. And yeah. so we have to rein it in sometimes that a while back we had to say, you may only have ice cream in this size bowl. Yeah. <laughs> Cause he was, you know, using the biggest bowls we had filling it up. And I'm like, I know you're hungry. Yeah. You're a teenage boy, but if you're really hungry, have a bowl of ice cream and leftovers or yeah. and frozen fruit or yeah. I think, I think at that age, I mean, when they're younger, when they're younger, sorry, you don't want to be talking about nutrition, but once they hit mm. like, I would say 10 and up, honestly, you want to start to include nutrition talk and it's age appropriate, of course. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, you're not talking about diets and weights, weight or anything like that, but you are definitely talking about balance and you are talking again, back to the mindfulness. Like, why are you eating this right now? Or do you notice your body craves sugar after you eat the carbs? It's just like little things you're putting you're just kind of planting in their minds and just notice it. I'm not saying you don't have to, you know, you can't eat it right now, but notice it. And then how do you feel? And like, if you go to soccer practice and you have this, you know, whatever, before you go or after you go, like, does your stomach feel okay? Like, do you feel like you got as much energy as if you had, you know, compared to that? So it's just, I think talking about nutrition at that age is important. Um, And from my experience so far, I think, restricting in the form of just going back to like what meals I can put in front of them when they're home with me, that's the best and only place I can do it. Mm-hmm. And outside of that, again, if they are outside of the home, they're outside of the home and they're grabbing what they want. Right. Yep. So, and then just one last tip for you or for everybody is back to the schedules if possible, even I know when they're older, but if they really, really learn, like there is no, like try, like, try to implement like kind of like, like no opening cupboards, no rummaging through the fridge, whatever. Like we're going to be having something specific at this time. If you can just hold on until then, and then hopefully serve something a little more balanced, but I know it's extremely hard. <laughs> yep. Well, and I think building that the whole FFP thing, like we should be mm-hmm. teaching that to our kids. And I'll say that all the time. Oh, you want to grab a banana? Can you find some fat or protein with that? I guess I, I guess I'm going for two out of three <laughs> at times, you know, but it's, it's definitely a worthy conversation. And I think too, one thing that we do, I mean, I know my husband grew up on, on Kool-Aid and soda pop. Like he talks now, like I didn't drink water unless I was involved in a high intensity sport. He didn't even drink water. I was like, Oh my God. I mean, we can't even imagine that now. Right. It's just such a different world. He said, I just wish my mom knew like she did her best with the information she had, but that turned into like a pretty bad soda addiction. And he had to completely cut himself off. It's probably seven to 10 years ago now, but he struggles right with health issues and numbers. And so we, we say to our kids, you know, I know you're not gaining weight, but it still sets your cells up, you know, and this is again, the middle school and high school. Um, but just kind of letting them know, like you've got our genes and we didn't, we weren't fed that well <laughs> when we were kids. So, but you're right. At least infusing all the vegetables, and the legumes and, and healthy fats and proteins is the most important thing. Yeah. If they like it and they can accept it, that's, I think the majority of the battle Mm because until they care about the nutrition, I feel like it's a little bit harder, but then once they finally like, okay, yeah, maybe I should like, you know, care about this one little thing. Now I can go ahead and I can eat all these things and I don't have to like cut out, you know, two, two or three pops a day in order to just like start drinking water for the first time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 We're giving them so much of a better foundation. I mean, my same kid with the sweet tooth makes himself a salad basically every day as part of his lunch, you know, because that's the food that he has available and he's too cheap to buy his own. Thanks be to God. <laughs> and we know if parents are listening and kind of feeling at the end of their rope with like snacks and sweets, 
let's like distill it down for our poor, overwhelmed mom and dad brains. What's like the one step that you think they should do first today after listening to this interview? I would, um, I would go to that feeding schedule just to kind of hammer that home and to kind of give you the biggest, I guess, bang for your buck piece of information. If you can be really great at having a set meal and a set snack time, and you're good at holding that boundary, that is going to go the longest way to helping your child be hungry for those nourishing meals that you're providing them. And, you know, learn how to mindfully eat and eat just the right amount for them. So that's kind of my biggest tidbit for them. That's fantastic. And encouragement to parents who are time challenged as I am, you don't have to like schedules to do this. Like we eat breakfast. We do this. Even those of us who don't like clocks and calendars, we eat breakfast, we eat lunch, we eat dinner, you know, so you can totally do this. I know my husband set our Google home to actually say at 10 o'clock it's snack time. (laughs) Yeah, the children stopped asking in the summer. So you can do it. Technology can help motive being motivated to do the right thing for your kids. Totally helped. Well, Edwina Kennedy, this has been amazing. Where should people follow you on Instagram for all your wisdom and tell us just a teeny bit about your course for toddlers. So you can follow me at my little eater on Instagram. I'm there daily, you know, giving out different tips and sharing the reels and doing all those things there. And um, you can also head to mylittleeater.com if you're interested in any of my online courses. So if you're starting solids with your baby and you want to learn how to feed your baby from six to 12 months of age, whether you're starting with purees or finger foods, uh, that course is for you totally step-by-step and shows you how to serve everything safely, introduce allergens and all the good stuff. Um, And then if you have a toddler, or a child up to age eight, the feeding toddlers course is for you. So this is all about how to prevent and manage picky eating. If it's already hit, that is okay. Again, a full step-by-step plan, a full protocol that will take you through what and how to feed your toddler to raise an adventurous eater. Fantastic. From registered dietitian, Edwina Kennedy, thank you again so much for being here. That was delightful. Thank you for having me. All right, parents, this is the Healthy Parenting Connector, where we connect you parents who really want to raise healthy, independent adults with the experts who have the information you need. And I will see you back next week.